Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Bernard, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Could you please introduce yourself to everyone out there listening? Uh, my name is Bernard F. Day. I live in Teaneck, New Jersey, professor emeritus at Fairleigh Dickinson University. And I came across a book you wrote called The Screen is Red. Could you tell me a little bit about what The Screen is Red? Well, actually, it's um, a study of the uh, Cold War movies. Uh, beginning shortly after um, the um, beginning of the Cold War, which would have been around 1946, when Winston Churchill gave his famous Iron Curtain speech. But even before that, I start with the uh, pro-Soviet movies that came out in Hollywood um, in the uh, early 1940s, when the Soviet Union was our ally. So in order to establish a goodwill relationship with the Soviet Union, Hollywood made a series of movies really glorifying the Soviet Union. Um, Mission to Moscow, The North Star, Days of Glory. And um, immediately after the war ended, after Vincent Churchill gave his Iron Curtain speech, Russia was no longer our ally, but it was the evil empire as Ronald Reagan called. Uh, I also go into the science fiction films of the um, 1950s um, in which the atomic bomb uh, experiments uh, and detonations in the American Southwest unleashed all of these prehistoric monsters. The idea being that the bomb is capable not only of destroying civilization we know it, but also of uh, uh, unearthing all of these creatures that had previously been dormant and uh, releasing them onto uh, our society. So uh, that was pretty much the um, thrust of the book. I also include the uh, films about the Korean War or the Korean police action, as President Truman wanted us to call it, uh, because they also show a total different approach to war than what one had in the films of the 1940s. I mean, the 1940s portrayed World War II as a good war. Korea was not the good war. It is now known as the Forgotten War, but it was an ugly war. And very interestingly, most of the great films about the Korean War, Steel Helmet, Big Spanets, et cetera, were filmed in black and white. And when you look at that terrain in North Korea, particularly in the winter, it is bleak, it is horrific. And um, I end with um, the um, series, television series, because I think that's pretty much where the Cold War is going to go. Uh, the Americans, about sleeper spies played by Gary Russell and uh, Michael Reese, uh, who were embedded in the United States. Um, it, it, during the uh, 1950s. And um, that pretty much is the thrust of the book. The subtitle is Hollywood Communism and the Cold War. And I deal with all three of those topics. One, what surprised you the most about all your work, just looking through the film industry and how important it was to the war? Because when I started learning about the massive amount of propaganda, I mean, good or bad, you can say like a light touch prop, like propaganda would be like having, you know, FBI agents in Disney cartoons or something like that. So kids can see the FBI agents. But then I started noticing like the influence of it, the way that they made the enemies look, the way that they made us look. I mean, the FBI, when they came on screen during J. Edgar Hoover's administration, were like these heroes that like, I think they could fire as many shots as they wanted. But then when it came to the enemies, they can only fire a couple of times and they had to miss. And it just had me thinking like, I mean, what is the impact of film and just history in general? Well, the impact of film, I'll, I'll go back to World War II because I, I could actually tell you 
where I was on December 7th, 1941. I was at the West Side Theater in Scranton, Pennsylvania with my grandmother watching Gary Cooper and Sergeant Dora. So um, beginning uh, in 1941, when we, I saw all of those movies, one after another, I started going to the movies probably around 1940. Um, I saw the war through the lens of Hollywood. And um, my friends and I used to wonder because the, you know, the outcome of the war was up in the air in 1942, 1943. We didn't know which way it was going to go. But, you know, we always asked ourselves, if America lost the war, uh, who would you prefer to have seen win it, Japan or Germany? And um, we all picked Germany because of the movies. I mean, they would line you up in front of the wall and shoot you. And you would scream out something like Viva la Liberté or, you know, long live democracy or what have you. But at least it would be over. Whereas the Japanese would stick bamboo sticks under your fingernails uh, and um, do all kinds of violent things to you. I mean, in Manila Pauling, which is 1942, you have these Filipinos, two Filipinos wander into a uh, Amer American base and one of them had his eyes gouged out and the other one had his tongue pulled out. So that's what the Japanese did. So yes, we were programmed against um, Nazism and also against Japanese imperialism through the movies. That's where I got my information from, and newsreels, of course. But my image of Nazi Germany came from film. My image of uh, imperialist Japan came from film because that was the only media besides radio, and radio didn't give you the visual component, of course, the film could give you. So yes, I am a product of that mentality. As a viewer that is looking at the screen and seeing the depictions of Germany and Japan, did you notice which one was, like you just mentioned, Germany seemed like you would just be lined up against the wall and shot, and then Japan seemed like they did a lot of extra stuff. Did you wonder why that they were showing just different characteristics or different kind of ideas of which one would be more extreme? I mean, even asking yourself the question, who would you want to win the war if we ended up losing the war? I mean, that's a weird question in its own. Well, not among children. I mean, you, you have to understand that movies, which are no longer a mass media, were the mass medium in the 1940s. And that was the era <clears throat> during which I grew up. So naturally, they would leave a far greater pressure upon me than print. I mean, I looked at newspapers, but I really didn't read them. I don't think most grade school children uh, during the 40s read newspapers, except for the comics, or maybe for the sports section. But my news came from newsreels, like M M March of Time, Paramount News, Cafe News, that you would see when you went to a, a, a theater. Because you not only saw the feature attraction, but you would get a cartoon, you would get a newsreel, and you would get previews of coming attractions. So yes, um, I belong to a generation that got our information about the war from A, the films that Hollywood was putting out, and B, the newsreels that we saw in the theater. Now, Radio what... did not have that much of an impact on me as far as news was concerned. Radio for me was, and I think for my generation, was the variety shows on uh, radio, uh, the um, Programs like Jack Benny, uh, George Byrne, and Gracie Allen, um, dramatic shows like Lux Radio Theater, Suspense, and Sanctum. I mean, there was a distinction between entertainment in the 1940s. There was the movies and there was radio. When it comes to the movies, though, I mean, did they depict like any signs of weakness or, I mean, I always know from influence of like some of the films, FBI's invasion into Hollywood and things of that sort with J. J. Edgar Hoover's administration, they had certain things that, you know, they wouldn't let directors do like the FBI had to look strong. They couldn't look, you know, weak 
you know, they looked for weird things kind of like, I mean, for the times they didn't want homosexuality. They didn't want things of this sort. So I'm curious when it came to depictions of the war, did they ever give like a reasonable take or a doubt that America didn't have it in the bag? I mean, I would have to think if you're a country and you're making films about the war, you wouldn't do anything to make yourself look weak. Well, you, you had to deal with the tan, you had to deal with Corregidor because we lost. Um, at the end of the 1943 um, film, The Ten, with Robert Taylor, uh, practically everybody is dead. Uh, and um, there is, Robert Taylor is the sole survivor, and he is digging his foxhole, which is actually going to turn out to be his grave, because the foxholes that were dug for the other men turned out to be their grave, and he would put a marker on each of them. And this is going to be his grave. Now, there's no way you could say that the tan would be a victory because it wasn't a victory. And everybody in 1943 knew that the tan had fallen, knew that Miller had fallen, knew that Corregidor was fallen. So Taylor is in his foxhole, hyphen grave, uh, with his machine gun. The Japanese are advancing and he is firing at them and saying, uh, of course, it was bleeped out, you bastards. Uh, and then the um, title comes on the screen saying, all right, yes, well, we will continue to fight and fight and fight until this war is over. It, not admitting that we had lost the Battle of Bataan, but that Bataan would be, um, the battle would be continuing and ultimately we would be vindicated. That is how you had to approach it. Even the Korean War, um, when um, in the movie um, Retreat Hell, uh, they lose the battle, whatever the battle was. And then um, the final line is, Retreat Hell, no, we're advancing in the opposite direction. So you retreat, but you advance in the opposite direction. I mean, we, we didn't admit to losing anything. Okay, so even when we had to lose, it was kind of seen as like more of like they would try and put a spin on it. Well, it was a moral victory. It was, it was a defeat, but it was a moral victory because we would go on and on and on, and eventually we would win, which is exactly what happened. Before you even decided to write the book or you just got interested in film studies in general, did it shock you at all the things you might have missed back then, looking at the screen that you're able to pick up now? Oh, heavens, yes. Um, I remember when I started um, writing The Screen is Red, um, I wanted to trace uh, the uh, topic to the 1930s, because I somehow thought that the 1930s would provide some kind of answer as to why capitalism was in such a state of crisis in the early years of the Great Depression. I'm thinking specifically what is now regarded as the worst year of the Depression, namely 1932. And then I came upon something that Nicholas Murray Butler, who was then the president of Columbia University, said, and I was absolutely shocked by it. He said that the men, you know the term men, not men and women, but the men of totalitarian countries are of much stronger character and much braver and more intelligent than those in the democracies. Now, in 1932, the president of a major university couldn't make a statement like that. I mean, today you may think it, but God knows he would never say it. But, but, but why did he think that? Well, he thought that because capitalism seems to have failed um, because of the overspeculation in the stock market. So what would be the alternative to capitalism? Well, his alternative would have been some kind of an autocratic state. Then there was the left that said the alternative is not an autocratic state, but a communist state, which in return, as it turns out, was actually as authoritarian as, as uh, a fascist state. So America was in a, at the crossroads in 1932, do we scrap capitalism and embrace some form of fascism, some form of totalitarianism, 
some form of autocracy, or do we go in the opposite direction and embrace some form of socialism and its most extreme form, communism? Now, when I look at what happened in the 2020 election, you have exactly a, an analogous situation. All right, it's not fascism versus communism. It's you want an autocratic state run by a strong man, or you want a democratic state run by a moderate. So it's, the, it's these extremes. Whenever a country is in a state of crisis, and let's face it, we are in a state of crisis today. I mean, Joe Biden did not win the election by a landslide. There were quite a few people who would have referred the Trump style of, 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 a, of a presidency, uh, autocratic, in many ways, almost despotic, as opposed to a democratic approach to the presidency. So we're in that situation today. I think with the, we're, we're a country of extreme. We've always been a country of extreme, either or. It's never neither nor, but it's either or. Either you're a Republican or you're a Democrat. Or going back to the 18th century, you either want to remain subject of the crown or you want to um, remove yourself from the crown. So that's pretty much the way it is. And, and it was amazing to me that in 1932, you know, you would have that kind of polarization particularly as articulated by the president of a university. Well, is that just a fuel from the Great Depression, though? Because I have to think that the Great Depression was a time. I mean, it's called the Great Depression for a reason. It hurt a lot of people. Um, I mean, there's people that still had lingering like idea, like my great grandfather would hide money in this house. I remember when he died, my dad's like, don't throw anything away. We got to search the floorboards. We got to search the walls. We got to search everything. But I think it's just because at that moment, there was a crisis in our country, my, like much like there's kind of one here today where there's two ideas of thinking. Obviously, everyone has opinions on if the way that we're going today is good or bad, but there's always been these questions of what we're going through society. Is it right or wrong? And the depression is a great example because at this point, everyone knew we were we got to try something new. Do we go the more one person, the figurehead that's the tough tough guy on communism that we see in the 60s and 70s, which is the whole idea of it's supposed to be, or do, do we change forms? And it's just this interesting question. I think um, I'm not right or left or anything. It's just looking at a lot of examples through politics and what influences. I mean, if you look at the word communism today, it gets thrown out like it's a, it's a, it's like, a, it's like a assault word. You know, you call someone, what are you, a commie? That's like a thing they say in the movies all the time as well, too. And there's this all out blunt through the whole media kind of outlet, even in movies from the 60s and 70s and so on about this idea of rooting out communists. And it's like, it's weird how we've kind of as we've always looked for someone who was a powerful figure. We want someone to clean up the mess, you know, someone that's going to squash out the enemies and keep us safe. I mean, that's the reason why through all of our presidencies, we've had the same exact, they need to be a family man. They need to be a Christian. And it's just weird because I feel like in today's times, it's still things that we aim for just because the idea is like, this is our model figure. Who's the Superman, you know, this person that's wearing a red cape and this aspect of things. Yeah. Well, um, we did get our savior, uh, in, uh, 1933, with uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Yeah. I mean, he... he uh, <laughs> they killed him. They killed him. Roosevelt, but he did... All right, he did adopt a socialist agenda. I mean, let's face it, social security, uh, the... Um, Bernard, they killed uh, him. They killed him, Bernard. For, yeah. Did you hear me? They said they he killed him. Us. Yes, well, it, it, but he saved us. Yeah. He saved us. And you say so with Franklin Roosevelt, I mean, when it comes to like, I mean, were there films that were playing back then? Um, I mean, I, I don't know when when films first started. I know they had silent pictures for a while, but the, my film knowledge only goes back probably to the 50s and 60s. Um, well, first of all, you would never portray Franklin Roosevelt on the screen. He was a presence. Um, if, if you saw Yankee Doodle Dandy, uh, James uh, Cagney, um, who plays George M. Cohen, does go to the White House. You don't see FDR, you hear the voice, that's it. Same thing in The Princess O'Rourke, 1943. 
um, uh, he, he is a presence. He would never, sh- he would never even get an actor made up to portray Franklin Roosevelt. I mean, he was a god. My grandmother was a Romanian immigrant. She had a picture of Franklin Roosevelt and a votive light in front of it, the way you would have a votive light in front of a statue of the saint. I mean, that's but he was. I mean, he, he saved our family, certainly, because my uncle uh, got a job through the CCC, and that brought income into the family. Otherwise, I don't know what would have happened. But yes, he was, he was our savior. And I think we are looking for a savior. We were looking for a Messiah today. And where is it? Or where is he? Or where is she? When it comes to presidents being depicted on film, when did that start becoming normal? Like, I feel like a, a lot of movies today definitely depict more of a president figure or just maybe not our president, but no, just a president. Have, uh, um, the, uh, <clears throat> um, Griffith's, um, well, I think his second, second to the last film was a film of, about Abraham Lincoln. I mean, he had several films about Abraham Lincoln, Young Abe Lincoln, Abe Lincoln in Illinois, and of course, um, about 10 or so years ago, Spielberg Lincoln with Daniel Day Lewis. Um, and you had uh, Tennessee Johnson, uh, you had Andrew Jackson, uh, um, Madison. It was quite common to have. Uh, films about presidents, well, Daryl Zanuck in 1944 was obsessed with Woodrow Wilson and made this, God, it was almost like three hours long movie called Wilson. It went nowhere. It was a very boring movie, and it still is if you see it on uh, television. But yes, uh, we we do have a long tradition of movies about presidents. These days, I think it would be um, more suitable for television. I, I know there was one about um, Hey Summer Hayes and um, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, um, and uh, also, uh, well, several about Franklin Roosevelt, Roosevelt on the Hudson, and so forth. Um, Sunrise at Campobello, also about Roosevelt before he became president. Um, uh, so, uh, yes, I mean, we, we do have um, a history of making movies about uh, political figures, including Huey Long. Not by name, but he was certainly the figure uh, of Willie Stark in um, all, of, all the King's Men. When we talk about films being political, I mean, has that always been like that? I mean, were the first like films back in 1930s or so, were they focused more political as well, too, compared to... Oh, in the 30s, they were, yes. In the 30s, they were. I mean, you you really had the rise of the social consciousness movies in the uh, 1930s. Uh, I mean, Wild Boys of the Road. I mean, these kids who were uh, uh, hopping freight cars and going from one city to the other in search of work uh, because their parents didn't have it. I mean, it, it really, a lot of those people think that you know, the movies of the 30s, um, in terms of musicals like 42nd Street, Gold Diggers is 33, Gold Diggers is 35, were designed to take your mind off of the depression. But there are a lot of films in the 1930s, like I was a fugitive from a chain gang, for example which really did not minimize what was going on in the country. Can you teach me a little bit more about the 30s to the 40s of film? Like what was their focus on and what was the kind of change towards the end of the 30s more into the early 40s? Well, at the end of the 30s, um, you, Hollywood did, uh, and it was very difficult for them to do it, uh, began to show a... Um, awareness of what was happening in uh, Nazi Germany. Um, you start getting films, and it's very tentative uh, in the 19, late 1930s, Three Comrades and the Mortal Storm, uh, conf- uh, Confessions of a Nazi Spy. Um, but, you know, well, Hollywood no not want to take sides at that point because they still had to worry about the international market, particularly the German market. Uh, and they went out of their way, not necessarily to um, offend um, Germany, but to portray what was happening without being very explicit about it. 
For example, it took a long while for Hollywood to use the word Jew in a movie. Uh, it was usually non-Aryan. Finally, uh, in 1940, um, in The Great Dictator, the great Chaplin film, Chaplin used the word Jew, which was really um, an unusual epithet because we, we never used that term. And then it got to be used after a while. Once we lost the German market, I mean, it was uh, no holds barred, you know. I'm curious. So when did they start? Like, why, why was that word started to be inserted more? Was that just because they just didn't care about the German market anymore? Well, um, if somebody had to do it, I mean, the irony of it is that the uh, motion picture industry is largely the product of Jews uh, and their uh, their children. I mean, you know, there was one studio, 20th Century Fox, which is known as the Goy Studio, because Daryl Zanuck was not a Jew, but Louis Mayer was, the Warners were, Carl Lemley was, you know, uh, uh, Adolf Zucker was at Paramount. I mean, it was, it was a Jewish creation. And Neil Gabler has a wonderful book entitled An Empire of Their Own, How the Jews Invented Hollywood. And it is true. It is the product of Jewish immigrants and in some cases, their, their sons. When did you see, I mean, how much of an influence with Hollywood really impacted when it comes to like a certain time period? Was it more about the 40s during the World War? Was it a little bit later on during the 60s and 70s? I feel like a lot of the political climate changes around the 60s and 70s to more of an observation on like domestic stuff as well as the Vietnam War. Yes, well, um, I, I can certainly say this about the 50s because politically, I think I came to the age of 1950. And uh, that was the result of having to listen to sermons about godless atheism and communism. I mean, uh, godless and atheistic are really synonyms, but you know, in the pulpit, it was always godless atheistic communism. It's like a hat on a hat. Y yes, uh, and uh, we, you know, it was anti-church and you know, the, and we heard all about horrible things that were being done uh, uh, to the conquered peoples of the Baltic states, Lithuania, Estonia, uh, and, um, and Poland and, and everything else, every country that was um, controlled by the communists, there were all kinds of atrocities were being performed. But to me, um, in 1951, I think I underwent some kind of an epiphany when I picked up the Scranton Tribune one day and discovered that Larry Parks admitted that he was a communist. Now, Larry Parks may be meaningless to some of your audience, but let me tell you, he was a major star in the late 1940s. He made this wonderful movie, which is still shown on television today, The Jolson Story. I mean, it's largely fabrication about the life of Al Jolson. But I'll tell you, to see him sing those songs, and well, he lip synced the two Jolson's music. But I was, I was very taken with Larry Parks. And um, to read that he was a communist or had been a communist uh, really uh, shocked me. And then I began to wonder well, what was so bad about communism? I was very fortunate when I was writing the book Radical Innocence, which was the study of the Hollywood 10, uh, that is the 10 who refused to answer what was then called the $64 question, are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? I did manage to know a few of them, and they were the most decent human beings I've ever met. And they would do absolutely anything for you. If they couldn't help you, they would put you in touch with somebody who would. I'm thinking specifically of Lester Cole, who was a wonderful man. Uh, he was an unreconstructed Stalinist. You couldn't say anything unfavorable about the Soviet Union to him. He did believe in the mantra, you know, each to his ability, each according to his needs, and which, which was fine. So we never discussed politics. But I tell you, when you look at those people, 
Uh, and of course, this is the 75th anniversary of the House on American Activities uh, Committee's investigation into so-called subversion, communist subversion of the Russian picture industry. When you look at these people today, they would be the equivalent of Bernie Sanders, Ocasio-Cortez, or any progressive. They just wanted a more democratic America. They wanted a Hollywood where blacks do not have to shine your shoes or cook your meals or wash your clothes or wait on you at table. They just wanted more equality for minorities as depicted on the screen, which was a noble goal and there was nothing wrong with that. So yes, they were progressive, but they were persecuted for being progressive because you had two choices when you went before the house and they asked you, uh, are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? You could take the Fifth Amendment, but if you did, you'd be ruined in Hollywood because taking the Fifth Amendment, we'd be privileged of saying, well, I probably was at one time, or maybe I would go on for a year or something like that, but that, that was it. The Hollywood 10 uh, believed that they were protected by their First Amendment rights because they believed that Congress cannot investigate what it can't legislate. And if it can't legislate your politics, it shouldn't be able to investigate them either. Now, that was very naive at the time. And they were naive. They were lambs in many ways. I mean, you know, thinking that, all right, I have my First Amendment rights. What First Amendment? What First Amendment? So the whole fear for them was just that they weren't going to be able to make another movie that their whole careers would be over with and Hollywood would blacklist them? I mean, how did Hollywood... I understand. I mean, you know, even if you weren't called before the committee, you look at an actress like Marsha Hunt. I mean, she did not belong to the Communist Party. She was very sympathetic to certain causes. Um, uh, I mean, if, if you, uh, for example, marched in a May Day parade or you read or subscribe to a magazine that was on the attorney general's list, um, you know, you, you would get gray listed. There was no work for her. And you wonder why? Well, you know, somebody named her. I mean, you get named in red channels. You pick up the red channels someday and you say, you know, you, somebody called you a communist. Well, you, you're guilty until proven innocent. But that is the way it, it works. Well, I mean, even with some some of the people in Hollywood looking through some of J. Edgar Hoover's files, I mean, during, on, it's on the FBI website. Anybody can look them up. There's Frank Sinatra, Marilyn Monroe. There's a bunch of names. And it's just like they would have people investigate these people to see if they were communists. And it's like, well, look at Martin Luther, what happened to Martin Luther King? It was the same thing. But what's communism? That's the thing is like even if someone just it you know makes a statement, they can be taken as a slight of communism and they can be blacklisted as such. So it was like just don't even do interviews. <laughs> well, well, today, I mean, there's always an ism. I mean, today it's sexism or racism. You know, um, if, if, if you compliment one on her dress or attire or a hairstyle, I mean, it's nice, well, that's sexist. Well, you know, maybe it is, but, you know, that we don't say anything. Well, if you look at the films today compared to the films through all the years, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, 70s, 80s, did you notice when it started to change where it seemed like Hollywood was trying to do its best to appease the domestic crowd or the audience crowd. Um, it seems like they made movies, but they probably had more of a thought of, if I make this film, is it going to piss off Germany listeners? Is it going to piss off these? But we have films today that they would call it a woke movement type deal where there are certain things that go on um, more with the times, I would say, where it seems like the audience is trying to check off certain bars. I mean, having a certain amount of this ethnicity in a film or having this in a direction of a film, really not necessarily making about the film anymore. I mean, it's more of a controversial take, but I think everyone's kind of noticed that it seems like Hollywood's just trying to check off all the boxes. If there's a lesbian relationship, they're going to add one. If there's a gay relationship, they're going to add one. It's like, this is a film 
about Star Wars. What are we talking about here? And it's just like, it's not necessarily anti. It's just like, it seems like they're trying to check off what the boxes would be to make sure that, you know, the every audience member, it's not checking one of those anti-racist boxes or it's not checking one of those anti-gay boxes. When you look at the 50s and 60s, they were making sure that nobody was gay. They were making sure that there was none of this portrayal in film. Well, you could uh, suggest um, homosexuality. Hitchcock did, certainly in Rope, uh, which was loosely based on the Love Leopold case, where uh, these two men literally, because they believed that they were intellectually superior to everybody else, killed uh, a, a friend of theirs uh, for no reason whatsoever and put his body in a trunk and uh, served uh, hors d'oeuvres on top of it uh, at, at, at a um, g- gathering. Now, those two men that played in the film by uh, Farley Ranger and John Dahl, I mean, they lived together in an apartment in a very fashionable section of New York. Now, you could look at them and say, well, you know, um, where are the women in their lives? Well, there are no women in their lives. But you could do this in a very subtle way, as, as he did, as Hitchcock did in Rome. He did it again in Strangers on a Train with the character of Robert Walker, who says to um, Bobby Granger, um, you know, I'll kill your wife if you kill my father. And just this is the way Robert Walker played the character that there was this element in his personality, which made, more or less made him a gay man. But you never used the word gay. And you, the way you did it was you never show him around women. But you could do it. And of course, it came to an end. Uh, well, I shouldn't say it came to an end. It really came to a point in um, 1959, 60, with Suddenly Last Summer, with Elizabeth Taylor and Montgomery Cliff, where um, it's obvious that a character whom we never see on the screen, Sebastian, is um, gay because he uses Elizabeth Taylor as bait. He makes him wear this uh, very provocative white bathing suit, which uh, was used in the ads. Uh, to lure young boys onto the beach so, you know, he would have his film. To me, it was always fascinating to, you know, the films that come out today compared to the films that came out back then, because, I mean, I looked at when the sex industry really kind of ramped off into films. I mean, when before they would have a lovemaking scene, they would cut to the fireplace, and then you would just assume that they had, you know love or whatever but then it became like to where it's at now where you see it and it's all very very graphic and i was born in these times and i'm surrounded by these times so looking back you know at the older films and seeing how like how the change is so like shocking to see like how did this happen where i'm going to ask you the question do you think it was more of an impact of the directors or do you think it was more of an impact of the actors that started to push the boundaries on film to a point to where now we have what we have today um, well, um, what, what started happening at the end of the 50s uh, into the 60s, culminating in 1968, when the ratings came into existence? See, before that, you have the production code. But then gradually, the production code got to be, um, a, 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 well, undermined. For example, um, you would never um, have. Um, somebody say to a Catholic priest, as Marlon Brando says to Carl Malden, who plays a priest and on the waterfront, you go to hell. I mean, you know, one never did that sort of thing. But somebody has to set it in motion. So you say to a priest, you go to hell. That opens the door to, well, anything. Then gradually, during the uh, 50s into the early 60s, you started getting uh, themes that previously 
were taboo brought onto the screen, such as homosexuality, advice and consent, suddenly last summer. And then in 1961 or 62, the children's hour in which a um, young student accuses two of her female teachers played in the film by Audrey Hepburn and Shirley McLean of having a lesbianic relationship. Then you know, get a little more with Bonnie and Clyde in 1967, which up to that time was the most violent movie ever shown on the screen. That meant that the production code is no longer operative. So in 1968, the ratings come in. And then you can start seeing bit by bit how filmmakers are beginning to challenge the Puritanism of the past with films like Midnight Cowboy, which was 1969 and um, was an X-rated movie at the time, who went on to win an Academy Award and two brilliant performances by John Boyd and Dustin Hoffman. Then more and more and more, and what my mother used to call the F word, began to be heard more and more frequently on the screen. Um, nudity, um, rather um, <clears throat> vociferous hot lovemaking, uh, very loud, very orgasmic, and, uh, and now, I mean, anything goes. When did, well, when did drugs first come on screen? Well, I mean, you had Reefer Madness, which, was, which is a ridiculous <laughs> movie. I think you could see it on YouTube. Uh, that, was, that was back in the 1930s. But uh, um, you mean smoking pot and that sort of thing? That's an interesting question. I honestly don't know. Smoking pot, taking LSD, any of the big ones. Oh. Because um, I've been learning about Timothy Leary, and I'm like, this this was such a big cultural thing of taking acid and taking all these types of well, drugs. Well, Grant apparently did uh, in an experiment. Um, well, well, that was a fad. I mean, I don't think anybody takes acid today. Or these, yeah, there's people that take acid. There's people that take acid. Oh, are there? My goodness, yes. Well, you belong to a different generation. Um, I mean, I smoked cigarettes, but that was the extent of it. Um, well, that's what films would do. Films like in Westerns, I remember seeing old Western films and, you know, they would smoke a cigarette and they would do like an ad in the, the movie. And it's like, I see that somewhat today. Like oh, I've yeah, seen... product, uh, yeah, product placement. It was usually Marlboro. Yeah, there'd be, there'd be a pack of Marlboros in somebody's pocket or on the table or something. Yes, you would think that that like the directors would start noticing, especially with the censor code when they started pushing back, was that their viewership was going up when they would show more drastic things for the times on screen. But then they still kowtow to when an advertisement company wanted to put a product placement in, which is like, doesn't that ruin the film? Well, it, 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 only if you're. <laughs> Uh, most people are not trained, I think, to look upon the screen as a canvas. And there's something going on in this quadrant, in that quadrant, somewhere else, something in the middle. I mean, you know, I, I think most people go to films, and I can understand it, want the plot, just want the experience of seeing a movie. I mean, uh, uh, when I used to teach film, it was very difficult to get them to say, all right, uh, Look at, look at the composition of this shot. Look at the telephone. Why is the telephone in such a prominent position? Because the set is so small. So that if you um, put the, tele the telephone right in the uh, center, right, right in the uh, extreme side of the frame, you know, it, the set is going to look bigger than it actually is. I mean, it's that, that, that sort of thing. And, you know, that fascinates me. I, but I can understand how we would not fascinate other people. I said, well, what, what's the big deal about the film? I think it's when you study film more, you start picking up things that an average viewer doesn't. Like, I, I've noticed that with some, like, they made a new film out recently in 2022, and I have a lot of issues with it. Um, It's about MK Ultra, you know, the, the CIA mind brainwashing experiment. 
it, it's not historically accurate at all, which sucks because they could have just did a historically accurate thing and it would have been way better. But what I started to notice in it was like they had certain scenes where they were trying out this drug trial and they made MK Ultra seem like it was an alternative form of treatment instead of getting a lobotomy because the one person that they had for the experiment was getting a lobotomy and mid lobotomy, a phone comes in and says, stop the lobotomy. We're going to pr put them in this new trial thing, which is MK Ultra. And he was the only person they showed getting into the trial. So everyone like the audience would just assume, okay, all these people were probably going to be given a lobotomy and now they're trying this trial. And I'm like, well, if you know anything about MK Ultra, that's not what it was at all. And it's just like, I wouldn't know that if I didn't like weren't, haven't made my own film and I hadn't been studying film and I haven't looked at small details, things where you pick up low angles, high angles, there are things that you notice in a performance now that really, I mean, it adds an extra layer to the film when you're able to look at a director and be like, oh, they shot it like this. So it would give this kind of reaction to the audience. Yeah, well, um, uh, but I, I don't think one can discount um, the popular approach to film. I mean, it, even the preamble to the production code said, the primary purpose of filmmaking is entertainment. And, and, and there was this controversy is, is it art or is it entertainment? Well, entertainment can be art. Um, and entertainment need not necessarily be art. But I think we have to take a more egalitarian approach to, to film. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's the scholarly approach and there's the popular approach. And maybe we can combine them. I'm, I try to in my own way, which is why I um, generally pick topics that um, represent film as a form of popular culture, such as the films of the 40s, the films of the 50s, the histories I did of the uh, Hollywood studio. And I think that's the best we can do. Do you think that it, it it should be a for, I like I think it should be a form of entertainment, but if it's a biography film, I don't necessarily know if I want it to be an entertainment type deal. Like I've seen many films about Elvis. I've seen many films about Abraham Lincoln. And let me tell you, Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter was way better than Lincoln. But at the same time, I like the historical accuracy, especially if you're going to do a biography. I mean, that's why we have documentaries. I mean, some of the documentaries out there, uh, Shutter, like the Three Mile Island that goes into the Chernobyl incident and all these I think it's a really good way to get people interested in the actual historical event because, I mean, I'm, I'm doing a JFK film, and I don't know how many JFK films there are out there, but all of them kind well, of go. Oliver Stones, which is really, I mean, you get the impression uh, from Oliver Stone that, I mean, everybody and his mother was responsible for the uh, assassination of JFK. I mean, it's just, but a lot of the, the mainstream stuff, a lot of the stuff of media reporting, I mean, there was just an article not too long ago that came out about Mary Farrell, the site that's not a conspiracy site at all, that's suing Biden for the release of the rest of the records that are out there because their date was 2017. I mean, Oliver Stone's film, whether you, I mean, he definitely added some things that made it more of an entertainment aspect of things, but it inspired the AARB. It inspired people to start reviewing these documents. Enough people wrote in to, and I've had some of the people from the AARB on my show. And I think that's an, an impactful thing. I mean, this idea of questioning or this idea of wanting, you know, being able to get documents released that are top secret. I think that's insane that a film can do that. Uh, well, but in the past, what is called the biopic. I mean, which is the uh, industry term for a biographical film. They, they were, there was a combination of the accurate and the inaccurate. I mean, you know, even in a movie like uh, Wilson, all right, there was um, Daryl Zanuck's love letter to Woodrow Wilson, but it doesn't end with the, uh, our, it ends with his determination um, to, uh, bring about the League of Nations, but we never belong to the League of Nations. But that's that's omitted. But that's a very important thing. So adding a detail to make it better. Well, uh, you don't want to end on the note of failure. I mean, yes, that was his dream. League of Nations. Did the United States belong to the League of Nations? No, we didn't belong. To the League of Nations. I've never seen the film, so I don't know. 
there's no reason to. I'll tell you, it's three hours. <laughs> I, th- I mean, I, I've seen a lot of films where they've added details to things to make it better. And I just feel like with a lot of things, like, I mean, those little details, they might seem significant, but it's always just the way that the movie's kind of pitched. I mean, it's going to attract a certain audience. I mean, we're in a time now where everything is Superman related or superhero related. And it's like, what is this? does this depict the times? Does this depict someone wants a hero? Someone wants someone to, you know, that's just their culture right now. I mean, Superman, nobody's complained that there's been multiple actors that have played Superman throughout the years. But, you know, we have, uh, I think it's the Black Panther character, the superhero Black Panther. The actor died of cancer and they're not replacing him. They're going to have someone step up in a different version. Like it's going to be a a, a replacement Black Panther, but they're making sure that they say that before they would have never mentioned like Christopher Reeves to a different Superman. Nope, this is just a whole new Superman. Well, I'd, I'd like to uh, comment on that, but frankly, I mean, I I don't really watch that many contemporary films. You don't like the newer stuff? Uh, I don't have time to like the newer stuff. I mean, I I just I finished a book um, that just came out in. Um, March about the um, musicals that Daryl Zanuck produced at um, Warner Brothers um, 20th Century and of course 20th Century Fox with people like Betty Graber, uh, Alice Faye, Marilyn Monroe and such. Um, and now I'm working on a book about Cole Porter's musical. So uh, I move into another direction and um, I, I'll occasionally look at a film on television uh, I was very impressed. I mean, I'll tell you <laughs> where I'm at at the moment. Uh, I was very impressed with two 2019 films. I think the last film I saw would have been a 2019 film. Namely, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which I thought was absolutely brilliant. It's fantastic. That's Quentin Tarantino, though. I mean, he's an amazing act, uh, director. Yes. And also what um, uh, Greta Gerwig uh, did with Little Women. I mean, it's it's the novel, but it isn't the novel. I mean, she takes key episodes from the novel out of chronology, but it still works. And I thought that was absolutely fabulous. I mean, it's not linear. That is, it's not it's not circular, but it's just episodic, but held together very beautifully, and a great performance by, by uh, uh, Ronan, uh, Sir Reese Ronan. But outside of those two movies, I can't really address contemporary film. But what it concerns me actually about um, the situation in the industry at the moment is that I'm beginning to wonder if movie theaters are gonna be a thing of the past. No, they're not. I just went to one yesterday. I, I mean, with everything available on Netflix uh, and all these streaming services and people being so reluctant we we had a neighborhood theater in China. We don't have it anymore. I think I, I I thought that too for a while with um the industries. I thought the streaming services were really going to take over. Uh, but I I just see theaters. There's something about being in a theater that does that just that just beats a streaming service. I think people wake up to that. But what I think is going to change about the Hollywood industry in general is. It's starting, people are starting to put the pieces together and seeing a lot of the dark side of stuff. I mean, there was always the story with Marilyn Monroe and what Hollywood did to her and just a bunch of other influences that kind of wrecked this poor girl. It's the same thing kind of with Elvis, that stardom kind of hit him in a sense too. Films are showing more of that that's kind of completing the pieces to why these people might have just gone off the deep end. Like there was not so long ago, I think it was maybe a year or two ago, the Michael Jackson documentary, um, think the saving neverland if i'm not mistaken and it really depicts a story of a person that went through a lot of hell through the industry and i think as an audience observer or just someone that is a fan and they see that and they see this person i mean most depictions of things back in the day would show you the down spiral of someone's life but m- would give you a bunch of influences and necessarily not talk about the fame or the industry aspect and now you're seeing this other side of people go We know the industry made them like this, and now they're showing that. And I think that's really important. The new Elvis film um, kind of depicts a little bit of that as well, too. Yeah. um, On the other hand, you have um, actresses, actors, I should say, like Merle Streep, 
who are totally unaffected by all of this. I know they're elites. They're legends. Yeah, they are. And Kate Blanchett is the same. Betty White too. And Julie Ann Moore. Yes, yes. Well, Betty, Betty White is not really a movie star, but I mean, she, God knows she had enormous longevity. I mean, I remember her from the 50s when uh, she was married to Alan Ludden from uh, Password. But then there's like shows like I Love Lucy that were just on television and everybody would, can't, couldn't wait to tune into it. I mean, those are things I'll see play in like the middle of the night or something like that like at 1 a.m or midnight or something like that they'll have these reruns of these old school tv shows and it's just interesting to see how that culture hasn't changed where there's still an aspect and there's still an interest and it's still entertaining to watch a lot of these shows as well too not only from like a fascinating just evolution aspect but just it's interesting i mean it's gonna be like seinfeld seinfeld everyone loves i'm not a fan of it but everyone thinks that the show is going to be around for years and years and generations and generations. Well, I mean, there, there is this station. Uh, I don't know if you have it where you are. Antenna TV uh, or Ion uh, is, a, is another one, which um, uh, you have uh, Fraser, uh, you have Alice, uh, you have uh, Barney Miller, um, you have the Jeffersons. You have all of those shows. I mean, there is no shelf life on any video production, television or film. They're constantly being shown. I mean, we have a franchise of, uh, 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 what, what is it? Uh, Optimum, cable vision. I mean, you'll be going through it and all of a sudden you'll say, oh my God, the Cider House rules. <laughs> I have a, I, or um, the bad news bears, or you know these movies that you think well they're in some oubliette somewhere, uh, or, or or in some ham hamper, all of a sudden they spring out at you that they're there, and that's the beauty of it. They're there. I mean, all of a sudden it's, like, it's alive, you know. It's there. I like that because uh, I, I I think. You know, there's films that have come out today and it's it's interesting, like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood um, is going to be a film. I feel like that will be one of these everlasting films. It'll be one of those things that'll be out there for a while, because, I mean, it depicts kind of a little bit like it goes into the Manson murders and things of that sort. And it's just stuff that people that well, experience the it never take place because the wrong they go to the wrong house. Yeah. That's a, the, the, the tape, the tape thing. But that was uh, Quentin Tarantino. If you ever listened to him explain that movie and him trying to give his depiction and his information that about the Manson murders and things of that sort. I mean, people lived through that. People remember that. It's what the, oh, that yeah, OJ that film lot. that came out. Oh, that, of course, of course. Um, that was 1969. Um, yeah. Um, he recreated Hollywood in that. I mean, I know the Bruin Theater at Westwood. My God. And when Sharon Tate goes to um, see the wrecking crew in which she appeared, I mean, that, that, to me, you see, that, that almost brings tears to my eyes. It gives you chills. Yeah, it does. It really does. But uh, I really appreciate the time you gave me to talk on my show today. I'm glad. I'm so glad you got me through this because I don't know what the hell I was doing. But uh, where can people find some of your books? Do you want to rattle off a couple of your links, your website or anything I like that? Have, oh, believe me, I'm sorry. I don't, I, I, I don't beat my own drum. Uh, I guess if you go on Amazon, you can find them. The latest one is, I said, um, The Golden Age, uh, Daryl Zanuck's Golden Age Musicals, colon, The Gentleman Preferred Blondes, which he did. I mean, all these great stars were blonde, Rabel, Faye, of course, Marilyn. Sherry Moore. Um, and, and if I live long enough, I hope I can finish the Paul Porter book. I'm sure you will, man. We got, we got another 50 years in you, I bet. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I really appreciate the time you gave me to chat. But one last thing for anyone out there listening who might be interested in getting into film at all, or maybe just wanting to go to experience a film, um, a little perspective that you have through all your years of working in just film studies. Um, well, all I can say really is um, enjoy what you see. 
um, if you want to study it more carefully, you, you can um, take, there must be adult education classes or uh, something like that, or get a textbook. I'll, I'll, I'll push my own textbook, Anatomy of Film, um, that's still available in, in its sixth edition. But, or any of them, any textbook on film, just look at it if you want to study it any further. If you don't want to study it, no big deal. Just enjoy it. Just remember that the primary purpose of film is entertainment. And as long as you entertain, it's more than just fun.